Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by Blue Bank Resort at Real Foot Lake. Visit bluebankresort.com to start planning your weekend getaway. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, as always, before I introduce today's guest, what is something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? I learned that we have 39 species of animals in the Regional History Gallery, and many of those are native to the Real Foot area. I did not know that. That 39? Could we not get one? Can we not get one more species? We got forty. An even number would be. I'm going to work on that. I tell you what. I'm going to delegate that to you. Can you find one more species? I guess if you're standing in there, you're a human being, so that would count as, as forty. Um, so our guest today and I, we could talk for a very long time. So Luke is going to have his uh, work cut out for him today editing this. So we're going to chat with Jeff Sellers, Director of Education and Community Engagement at the Tennessee State Museum. Welcome. Hey, Scott. Uh, thank you so much for having me. This is uh, uh, it's, it's, it's something that uh, I really think is a cool thing you guys do in, uh, over there in, uh, at Discovery Park. And, and man, I just really appreciate you uh, taking the time to have me on the show. And uh, yeah, looking forward to our conversation. We can go all day. I'm, I'm fine. I'll, I'll clear out my schedule. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the last time we talked on the phone, I could have gone forever. So um, <clears throat> we're eventually going to get to John Hay- Haywood, who um, Haywood County, where where my people are from, uh, was named after and uh, Tennessee's uh, first historian, the father of Tennessee history, whatever you sure. want to call him. He was very eccentric, fascinating life. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about him and some of the work you've been doing um, with him. But first of all, we want to find out a little bit about you. Um, tell me a little bit about where you hail from. Well, uh, Scott, I, I am uh, I am I am one of those uh, many, many, many imports to Tennessee. I'm ashamed to say uh, in some ways, but uh, I am I, I hail from um, UCLA. I always like to, to tell this corny joke. Um, and that is, uh, many people say Lower Alabama. You hear, I'm from L.A., Lower Alabama. Well, I'm from UCLA. That's the upper corner of Lower Alabama. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm from rural South Alabama, but, but I, I man, it took me a few years, a couple decades to, uh, to figure out where I, I, should, I belonged, and that was here in Middle Tennessee when my wife told me that's where I belonged, and uh, here we are. She is a native Tennessean. Um, I uh, went to graduate school at, at Middle Tennessee State University and studied uh, public history, got a master's degree there, met my wife, who was in the doctoral program at the time. I tell people it was a match made in history. She hates it when I say that because it's so corny. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, this is uh, this is my home now, and I've been here for 20 years. And uh, lo and behold, I know more Tennessee history than I ever knew of Alabama history. So here we go. <laughs> Yeah, you know more. You know more Tennessee history than just about anybody. So, um, did was was little Jeff? Um, were you uh, uh, passionate about history as a little boy and knew what you wanted to do, or how did you end up uh, in history? You know, I love that. I love that. Yeah, I, I always have. I don't know. It's the chicken and the egg thing, but uh, I just always was drawn to it. I, I tell people I, it's an affliction. I wish that I could be a doctor or a lawyer and do all that stuff, but but I'm just drawn to it. And it, uh, and so I, I followed the sort of the do what you love kind of uh, model of life and it hasn't let me down. I love it. And, uh, I do it on the part time. I do it on the full time. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, I just, uh, you know, I can remember, I have the, the, those light bulb moments. I found an era head, uh, as we were building our house and, uh, you know, I still have that arrowhead and it's, it's hanging in my, in my room. I mean, I, and, and I'm also draw, drawn to the object of, of, of the past and, uh, for some reason. It, and so here I am at the museum and it really, uh, it's a great, great place to be. I've been, been here at the Tennessee state museum for, let's see, gosh, coming up 16, uh, 16 years in September. So, uh, yeah. 
I love it. So you've been around um, while you were in a, in a whole different building and then while they went through the whole process um, to build this big, beautiful building um, that you're in now. Uh, for people who are listening who've never been, um, talk me through a little bit of what I would find if I were to visit the current Tennessee State Museum. You know, for you, you folks, your listeners out in West Tennessee, if you have not been uh, here to the Tennessee State Museum, we're located um, in downtown Nashville. Don't let that scare you. Um, we're not on the we're not on, on Broadway area. Uh, we're a little bit north of that. So we're, we're a little more uh, a little, little calmer region of, of Nashville here. We're, but we have uh, plenty of parking. And, and this is the state's museum. I, I encourage all Tennesseans. This is your museum. It is a public facility. We are. Um, we are we are publicly funded and um, and and you pay for it with your tax dollars. So please come see it. It is a beautiful gift to all Tennesseans, and it and it really starts with the earliest uh, geologic times. So we go through the entire geology geologic formations from the the mountains in the east to the to the delta region where you guys are, and then we take the history all the way up to the 20, 21st century. So if you come here, you'll actually see artifacts that make you feel really old because uh, you're going to see your first cell phone um, <laughs> and things like that. So, but yeah, we really have uh, exhibitions that focus on the Jacksonian era of Tennessee, the early frontier, the first peoples of our state, the Chickasaw, Cherokee, and Shawnee. And also um, Civil War has a huge exhibit as well as civil rights. Um, it's just got everything, all things Tennessee. We like to think of ourselves somewhat as the Smithsonian of our state. So uh, it's a great, great facility r- right on the Bicentennial Mall here. Um, so it's it's a beautiful place to. And how long has the new building been open? You know, it's hard to believe, but the museum opened October of 2018. And so much water is under the bridge in those in those few years. But uh, we're going to celebrate four years, October 4th uh, this year. So um, it, we're still kind of figuring out how this building operates, kind of finding new, new ways to um, turn on the lights and, and things like that. But uh, it's, a, it's a great facility. You read my mind. So when I was at Graceland, uh, there was this, they didn't want people walking on the grass in front of the house because it was smooshing down the grass and just making it dirt. And so at some point they came up with the brilliant idea, let's just pave that. And it was the shape of a keyhole. And so that was called the keyhole. And so I was curious, um, what are the keyholes that you guys have found yet? Is there anything that you've noticed people are gravitating towards or a route they're taking that's different than what you expected? Or what are some, are there any surprises that have, have uh, come to light? Yeah, you know, uh, it, it is, it's, it's kind of, we have what's called a time tunnel and it's very, it's kind of the first of its design in, in museums. The newly um, open National Museum of African American Music also has this same sort of design. And so it's funny to see, you know, visitors have a choice whether they can go through the time tunnel if you're very, if you're what we call a skimmer and you don't want to like dive deeply into every single topic, or if you're a studier, then you can do that in the galleries. So it's kind of funny. Most people, most people go deeply into the galleries and don't skim through the time tunnel. Um, but it's fun to kind of, it is more of a free choice in a museum kind of environment. Yeah. For, for, for those at home, um, there are swimmers, skimmers, and divers is how we look at it. And right. so we, we try to make it so that everybody has something they can experience. Um, what, um, you know, the, the thing that pops in my head when I think of my visit and I love, you know, Tennessee history, of course, and I love the, the, everything you guys are doing, but the Conestoga wagon jumps in my head when I try to think back, what is my favorite? I don't know. That's my favorite artifact, but do you have a favorite artifact or exhibit or gallery? Gosh, that's, uh, that's always a great question. Uh, you know, for, for one, also for your listeners, the state of Tennessee is very fortunate because it collectively as a people, we have we have collected our state's history for well over 150, 175 years, even 200 years. Um, and so we've got this fantastic collection of really cool objects. And the Conestoga is definitely one. I think one that just stands out as a, just a giant object in my mind is is uh, Andrew Jackson's inaugural top hat. 
um, <laughs> you know, you, you go to the Smithsonian, you see you see Lincoln's stovepipe hat. Well, we have his top hat that he wore the day he was inaugurated as the seventh president of the United States. And the thing that makes that so special, not just that, is it has a black band on it. So it's a gray um, beaver skin hat, very fancy hat, as you might imagine, but it has this um, black band on it. And for those of us knowing that know the history of Jackson in that era, he had just lost his wife, Rachel. She had died uh, right before he left for the White House. So he was going to Washington as as a widower and in, 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 in mourning. And that was a mourning band that he had attached to his hat. So it's kind of interesting to think, gosh, he was at the at the at the peak of his of his career and his life and one of the most probably joyous moments of his life, but also one of the most the, the saddest moments of his life. And so those are the types of things that objects can kind of bring out is that that power of of um, emotion that, um, that 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 those objects can symbolize. So that's my favorite. I love to geek out and talk to folks about that one. And the the fact that you know he was going to Washington and that he felt like his um, opposition had essentially killed his wife because they talked so much about you know their marriage and and the, and and how. You know, they married slightly before she was completely divorced. And so, you know, the the embarrassment and the, you know, he felt so imagine, you know, what he was like to his enemies. When you think about the era that we've all just been going through where everything is so divisive, I would say that's another time in the past when things were very divisive in oh, politics. Gosh, yes. Uh, you know, I, I always, I, I, one, one of the things we do at the museum and part of my job is to manage tours of the state capitol as well, which is another building your, your listeners need to come and enjoy as well. We'll be happy to give them a tour of that. But yeah, so politics always is uh, kind of, kind of um, rears its head through our historical discussions. And, and yeah, it's, we are not the first generation to deal with even this level of discord and uh, and and division. Uh, and Jackson's era was certainly that. He was he was the first kind of president to say, you know what, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have my friends around me. I can trust my friends. I'm gonna and and that was largely due to the uh, the the campaign that had been run against him and against his wife uh, Rachel. And so he doesn't he doesn't put out that olive branch, uh, which many of his success or um, his predecessors did. Uh, and so he 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 yeah, he sort of consolidates his power around his allies and his friends, which was replicated among most all other presidents since then. And you can I mean, you can look at what you know, I mean, there's a lot of scholars and people who are fascinated uh, by that era. Um, but it's interesting um, to to know how some of those guys did a great job that were around him and some of them did a not so good job. And so there were all these scandals and, you know, it's fascinating when you look back through other presidencies, how they surrounded themselves with people from their home state, you know, and, and what happened. So anyway, it's, it's fascinating. Tennessee has a really interesting history um, all the way back to the very beginning. Um, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today is uh, John Haywood. So, um, just in, of course, I've have his books at home that I've, you know, used for both, you know, just for fun, looking at history and writing blogs and goofing around. Um, and if, you know what? I knew that John Haywood, I knew he was, uh, where they got the name for Haywood County, where my people are from, but I hadn't, ha- had not dived in too carefully into him. Um, and so in preparation for our conversation, I got all caught up today in reading all the stuff online about him. So interesting. Um, he's called everything from the father of Tennessee history, a fascinating eccentric, an overlooked Tennessee historian. Uh, he's called the author of the most important legal innovation in antebellum Southern history. And in his, uh, in his obituary, he was called the Lion of the Forest. Uh, from the terror of whose voice every inferior animal fled. So he was really a fascinating character. Um, he was an imposing figure at, you know, 400-ish pounds, uh, a big, big guy. Um, for listeners who um, have never even heard of John Haywood, why don't you just give us a little bit of his backstory? Yeah, sure, sure. You know, uh, it, you're right. It is Haywood County. Many of your listeners may come may be there in Haywood County. And uh, so it's always 
cool to learn about who your namesake is. And I believe even there's some, um, you know, a lot of the Haywoods um, um, sort of moved down out to the West Tennessee area. So uh, if we've got any family there, um, uh, you know, he uh, or any descendants. Uh, so so John Haywood is, yeah, he is a pillar in, a, in, in Tennessee history. Anyone who anyone who studies Tennessee history deeply will run into uh, this man. And uh, you're right. He's an eccentric. He's a hard guy to, to figure out. Number one, there's, there's not really a whole lot of biographies on him out there. Uh, so we don't know. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a whole lot that you can read secondarily uh, from him. Secondly, there's not a whole lot of uh, letters that were left behind uh, of the man. But uh, just to give you a quick bio of him, he is he is eccentric, but he's also probably he was also probably brilliant. Um, this guy was a prolific author. He was a, um, a, 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 a maybe a genius level um, lawyer, uh, and 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 also he was he found time to be a, a historian as well. Now this is not a historian like professional historians like we think of today, like um, people in the in the um, in academia, but he did take the time to reflect on what had just happened over the last fifty years. So he was very, um, you know, he was a contemporary of all of these um, people who had really um, um, sort of settled uh, East Tennessee and Middle Tennessee, and then what was becoming West Tennessee. Um, but he he's from North Carolina. He is born in 1762 during the end of the French and Indian War. Think about that. Uh, and his father and his, his lineage actually comes from Barbados, from the Caribbean. Um, uh, his grandfather had been on a sugar plantation uh, down there and, and knew the Lord, of, Lord Granville uh, uh, from, uh, um, in Great Britain. And so they had received this. They had received this plot of land from Lord Granville in North Carolina, in Halifax, North Carolina. And so he really has very little formal academic uh, instruction. He teaches himself basically law through uh, reading case law, which is at the time you were lucky if you had an apprentice or serve as an apprentice as a, under a lawyer. And uh, and so he he basically teaches himself how to read law. And by his early twenties, he's practicing. And, and is doing a really good job and gets a judgeship um, in the, in, uh, you know, soon thereafter, about 24 years old. By the time he's 28, he's appointed attorney general of the state of North Carolina. Uh, so in the 1790s, his star is really rising. And about four years later, after that, in the mid 1790s, he's appointed to the Superior Court of Error and Appeals, which is a, basically the Supreme Court of North Carolina. And that's where things kind of hit a turn there uh, as he was serving on Supreme Court of North Carolina, uh, the Secretary of State, Glasgow is his name, Glasgow, uh, gets caught up into in a controversy uh, here in in what became or what was Tennessee. There's a lot of Revolutionary War land grants and and Glasgow is 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 suspected of, of fraudulently signing a lot of these grants. And uh, well, he's good friends with Haywood, who is supreme on the Supreme Court of North Carolina. He asks Haywood if he would um, if he would um, defend him in his trial, upcoming trial. And Haywood knows this is a long shot because it, he looks guilty, um, but nonetheless, he does. He 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 resigns from the bench and uh, appoints or uh, serves as his lawyer. Hey, uh, Glasgow is found guilty, nonetheless. And both, because Haywood was sort of associated with him, um, both may or Glasgow was certainly um, uh, fined and and uh, and had a had a uh, black mark on his reputation. And I think Haywood might have also had that because he was defended him, and although he did not have anything to do with the fraudulent land deeds, um, but nonetheless, his 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 star was kind of um, uh, marked there in, in North Carolina. And so um, he, he practices law privately uh, for the next few years until he moves uh, uh, to Nashville in 1807. He was good friends with John Overton, uh, also good friends with Andrew Jackson, 
and they were they were saying come here you know there's plenty of law work to do uh here in the west western um theater where there's lots of land disputes as you might imagine and those guys along with winchester they love to get people to come to to tennessee and sell them land absolutely they were were great uh uh, promoters of uh, tennessee land at the time yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're recruiting him to come over, and of course, Haywood is obligingly buying up land here. Like if, like many of the people did, there a lot of these rev war grants were not obviously um, settled by the people that they were um, that they were uh, assigned to. So they would sell them for pennies on the dollar to people like Haywood and Overton and Jackson, and uh, and then they they come out here and and begin speculating on these lands. Uh, nonetheless. He starts writing. Uh, in 1802, he writes the Acts of the North Carolina uh, Law, the first book written on the Acts of, of North Carolina. And by 1807, 1809, he's writing those same laws, uh, law books for Tennessee. And then he, he basically becomes a, a, an author and he writes about the Christian advocate. But he's also an extreme, eccentric guy. As you said, he's upwards of 350 to 400 pounds, which is unheard of in those days um and so he uh he's also he believes in ghosts and water witches and things like that that he writes in in his christian advocate and he also tries to figure out he's fascinated by the what we know today as the mississippian indian culture uh the mound builders he's fascinated by this but a product of his time he he doesn't give the native americans the credit to have that type of civilization so he tries to explain it by even saying this is a lost tribe of of, uh, the lost hebrew tribe so there's all kinds of things we can get into regarding all of that but nonetheless in 1820 he formed he forms the first what we know as the historical society of tennessee and that's the antiquarian society of tennessee forms that isn't that interesting i mean there was barely a history you know, to, 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 it's so great that he started it then, you know, and, uh, you know, I love reading his descriptions of Tennessee at the time. And cause I'm fascinated with, you know, who stood here before. And so I'm so glad he captured it, you know, and put it, put it down like in the book, uh, the natural and Aboriginal history of Tennessee is fascinating to me. So anyway, yeah, I love, I love the stuff that he wrote. Yeah. You know, I mean, had he not, written down i mean think about it we do a lot our own culture does this uh, you know as the world war ii generation began to die off um it was a you know each 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 pre or each generation after that realizes oh my gosh you know this this generation is dying away we have to um record their stories we have to collect their their stories and we have to memorialize their stories and and we did that um and uh, the same is, 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 is happening today with the Vietnam era and the civil rights era. Um, and so he's doing that on the frontier era. So a lot of these old pioneers are dying off. And he knows them. He knows John Severe. He knows uh, Andrew Jackson. Um, and and uh, James Robertson has recently died. He dies when, when he's in there. So, so he knew a lot of these guys and, um, and thankfully interviewed them. Yeah, it's it's so fascinating. I love those firsthand connections. Um, now, some of his thinking was, as you said, a product of his day. So he was, um, you know, um, Andrew Jackson used a lot of what he wrote uh, in his 1830 Indian removal bill. And so, you know, he inspired a lot of thinking that wasn't necessarily uh, beneficial for minorities or women, you know, but as you said, he's a product of his day. And so it's fascinating to read his descriptions of the people that he encountered in Tennessee at the time. Right, right. You know, I mean, he, he's not, he's not a historian that says, okay, let's, let's, let's take uh, and give primary perspective to uh, the native American, um, right. uh, unfortunately. And, uh, in, in, you know, um, women are a tangential uh, part of the story, and and uh, certainly African Americans are not um, are not treated as a as a as a focal point of the histories there. Although what 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 historians can do, what it allows us to do today, is it gives us a, a glimpse at those stories. And there are 
uh, we can come at those stories now because there are there are those tangential uh, pieces there. So we do have a record of um, women's roles in the in the pioneer era, as well as African enslaved African Americans as well. So um, there are things that modern professional historians, just the fact that he he recorded these events, are able to glean from that. And so at some point he moves to um, a um, a plantation and it's called starts with a T Tusculum Tusculum. So he moves to uh, Tusculum. He has a plantation. He and does, and he has uh, some children, some slaves. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. What happens next in this four hundred pound man's life? Yeah. So. He, uh, yeah, he moves to Tusculum. That's, that's named, I, I only know this because I've studied it. Um, it's, that's, uh, he named it after Cicero's home outside of Rome. And, uh, you know, um, he might, the, the great orator of Rome. Uh, that's a good trivia question. That for, is. Uh, Tennessee trivia. That is. That's a great trivia question. Uh, and it says the crow flies about, I don't know, three miles from John Overton's um, plantation as well. So, um, but he sets up, he comes here and, and sets up a law school, essentially, and is really kind of credited as being the first law school in the Southwest. Uh, and, and many of the, like you said, the judges that would go on to, to um, adjudicate things like, uh, you know, Indian removal and things of that nature are reflecting back on his decisions um, uh, of of uh, the Supreme Court in Tennessee, I should also mention he did become the the, the Supreme Court Justice of Tennessee, and uh, almost like the Chief Justice, although they didn't have it at the time. So he's really the only guy, or one of the few people who've ever served on on the uh, Supreme Court of two different states, and really basically write the first law uh, books for each of those states. So and there is uh, a Haywood County in North Carolina as well. That's correct. Um, and so it's confusing when I'm doing genealogy research and I think I've found something. I have to double check and make sure I'm in Haywood County, Tennessee and not Haywood County, North Carolina. Yeah, absolutely. I was uh, I was I was I went snow skiing with my family last year in Maggie Valley, North Carolina. And I said, oh, my goodness, this is Haywood County. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, the Haywoods also there were other Haywoods in uh, North Carolina that were pretty prominent as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, he, he, he basically comes here and starts writing, uh, the history. Aboriginal history is first, is the first volume set. And then the more that we're accustomed to is the civil and political history of Tennessee. And that, 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 that is one that deals with mostly, you know, the state of Franklin, uh, early, early pioneers of, uh, middle Tennessee, and um, and also kind of uh, the Indian Wars of the 1780s and 90s. And then um, at some point, he passes away. Yes. And um, I'm assuming they had to get a very big coffin to put him <laughs> in at the, yeah. at the time. Um, and so uh, we're going to take a break um, here. Um, but when we get back, we're going to fast forward ahead to 1988 and the Tusculum Hills Baptist Church. So that's just a little teaser for everybody. Um, And we'll be um, right back with Jeff Sellers talking about uh, John Haywood. If you have not yet experienced Blue Bank Resort with its tasty catfish, handcraft beers, and wide porch and patio on Real Foot Lake, then you need to start booking your trip now. Blue Bank Resort is one of the best spots for dining, cocktails, live music, and gorgeous sunsets. Visit bluebankresort.com for more information. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive, only positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast catcher of choice. Our guest today is Jeff Sellers, and we're talking about John Haywood. Um, I fast-forwarded us to 
um, a Baptist church um, that had been built on top of where John um, Haywood once lived and where his um, he and his probably his wife were buried. It was 1988, and the good people of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church wanted to expand their building, which is a you know I mean a lot of people go to that church, it's a great church, and so they said we need a bigger building. Um, but they had this they had this big um, tombstone thing in their back, and so they needed to they needed to figure out what to do with that. So what happened? Okay, so yeah, 1988 Tusculum. Tusculum now is no longer Cicero's home or John Haywood's home. It is now a big Baptist church, and it's getting bigger in 1988. They want to build a rec center there, uh, and, uh, and, and, but there's this giant obelisk in the way. I wonder if they knew that he liked all those ghosts and occult things. They might be scared if they knew. <laughs> they probably prayed over. They prayed over it enough. Where it was oh yeah, okay, yeah, sure. yeah. They had already exercised all of those things. I'm sure long before yeah. that. Uh, but uh, yeah, no. He um, so the Tuscan Hills Baptist Church it wants to wants to expand. They had this obelisk there, and the obelisk basically says, "Hey, this is uh, um, attributed to the grave." of John Haywood, state historian. Oh, and by the way, Haywood County is listed on that obelisk as, a, as, as having paid for it, um, along with the Historical Society of Tennessee and the Tennessee Bar Association. So members of the church call our st- uh, state archaeologist at the time, Nick Fielder. He's a good friend of mine, great guy. Uh, and, and, and they call him in to say, hey, uh, we think we've got a grave nearby here, and we certainly don't want to hit it. So can you come help us out? So Nick comes, who, an archaeologist, boy, they really know about graves and that, that sort of thing, know how to find them. It's just amazing when you talk to archaeologists on all of these things. Anyway, Nick says, okay, I can find this. And there's a little little white um, kind of limestone rock there, uh, about probably 10 feet from the obelisk. He says, okay, there's the grave. So um, he prods and, 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 and pokes um, a rod down into the ground that, that can tell you where the grave is. Well, nothing. He doesn't get anything. On either side of that stone, he doesn't find anything. So they start digging. They dig down into the stone, and the stone says Haywood. It's a footstone for a headstone. It says Haywood, but nothing else. And there, he's perplexed. He has no idea. There's no grave here at all. And so he says, you don't have a grave here. You're fine to, uh, fine to build your building. Uh, and they do. And so to but now my question to you yeah. from looking at the pictures, um, did they try to move the obelisk and, um, they weren't able to because they built their church kind of right up around it. <laughs> yeah, no, they didn't try to move that obelisk. Uh, and so the obelisk is still there, but they did build it very close to the obelisk. <laughs> after the after after Nick gave them the all clear, uh, they 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 went ahead and built that rec center there. And uh, and the church has been really great about this project too. I should say, um, very very receptive rep, receptive to it and everything. But but that well, he might have he might have been into the occult in his life and into ghosts and stuff, but um he's at church every single Sunday. He is. He's very close to uh he's very close to the 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 the, the Baptist church there. You're right. Uh but Nick, so that sent Nick down a pathway. He said, where is this grave? And so he he he, he has really been the spearhead to try to find this this grave for the last, gosh, what is that? Uh, I'm not quick on my feet with math, but definitely over 30 years, he's tried to find, uh, 33 years, I guess, tried to find the remains of, of John Haywood, the first historian, and his wife, Martha, at least those two. And so um, he's looking um, for the grave, and he finally, thanks to uh, Steve Rogers, is that the the guy who found the actual headstone in the collection of the museum yeah so so yeah so there we go to the state museum and um and and the actual headstone what what nick found was the base stone that says haywood right but the actual headstone was in the the collection of the state museum where i work um of course this is long before me uh and it says john haywood and but did they know did they know they had it or was it just 
I think it was kind of, I think it was sort of by happenstance it says oh this is where yeah you know, the the state museum uh, has it I think I think it went when the obelisk went up it went to the state library and archives through certain people channels and finally was transferred to the state museum but the and and, and that that um, headstone says what you might think it says. John Haywood, 1762 to 1826, author, jurist, historian, blah, 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 you know. Um, uh, and, uh, but the thing it said on the back was, it said, grave 26 feet, eight inches south of this tablet with a arrow pointing to where the grave was. And so from that moment on, Nick knew that the actual grave was probably uh 26 feet south of that that area now and i think it's fascinating it's fascinating that the reason that they didn't put the grave they didn't put the headstone on top of the grave is because the farmer who was farming that land you know didn't want to have to give up that piece of land and so they obliged him um, and put it elsewhere and thank goodness they you know carved that on the back that's I've, i've never even heard of that so that was incredible me either me either it's so bizarre but so, so yeah, you're right. So they, the reason why they couldn't put it right over the grave is because it was on a different piece of property. And so you might imagine in this 26 feet, there's a fence between the two. And the farmer who had it in 1911, that's when this gravestone was put up by the, by the Tennessee Historical Society. The farmer says, no, I, f- I farm that field. I own it. Uh, and I, I don't want to, I don't want you plopping a gravestone right of, over the field that I'm farming. And so he basically tells the Tennessee Historical Society, deal with it. And so they, they put the headstone as close to his grave as they could <laughs> and, and gave a directional arrow to where, um, they thought his grave might be. And that's a big thing. They, this, they're doing this in 1911. So they're sort of guessing as to where the actual, remains might be the graves might be and so um you guys have all these clues now and you know you've kind of know where when you I, I i've never actually looked for a grave myself so i don't know exactly what you do but i'm assuming it has to do with big machines that look like metal detectors and you know so so they do sonar and stuff and do they find the grave yeah so that's you know uh, there's there's different ways that you can do that you know I, i'm learning this too scott i mean this is all new to me too i i i, I deal in in museums and education um but they they can they can do a rod down and 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 really when you when you hit that what would be the grave shaft uh it'll obviously it'll be easier to push the rod down so you they can tell that way a lot of times but what we've done uh right before covid i mean literally right before covid shut everything down march of 2020 um uh we um along with the mtsu department um of uh of, of archaeology uh had a did a gpr survey ground penetrating radar survey and it looks just like a small lawnmower that you push across an open piece of ground and it'll send that uh, 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 radio or that radar frequency down and bounce back up and it will actually show you um uh, ground disturbances that look like graves so um they did that and uh, I should give Zeta Law, Dr. Zeta Law, credit there. She is one of the state's best GPR experts, and uh, and she she and her team um, analyzed those results. And there's there's pretty um, good evidence that uh, there could be some graves there where we're um, kind of targeting uh, in this area. I, also, I should also mention it's not just next to the church; it's next to right behind a Marathon oil station and a Haviland oil changing um, station as well. So, um, and that's who actually owns the property of where we believe the graves might be. And and in in today's Nashville, uh, development is all around and it's, it doesn't take much for something to become developed really quickly. Yeah. I looked at the uh, pictures of where it is on Google earth just so I could get a sense. Um, and I mean, he and his wife, they are at a, at a service station. Yes. Much. 
you know, literally um, behind but, the dumpster of a service station. <laughs> yeah, which, which is which is clearly you know not the way anybody really wants their history to be taken care of. Any state, you know, want their you know you want your significant folks to be um, to have proper burials for history's sake. Um, and I should we should also mention it's not just the Tennessee State Museum working on this. It's or the Tennessee Historical Society and the Tennessee Legal. Yeah, so I should probably clarify that. It's certainly important. Um, I'm doing this on uh, as not a part of the State Museum. This is remember how I said I like to do side gigs and side projects mm-hmm. and things. This is something that me and Nick and and others are doing really on our own as uh, not affiliated with the State Museum at all, but. But uh, yeah, the um, I am a, 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 on the board of the Nashville City Cemetery Association, and really uh, that organization is helping um, spearhead this because we we hope that uh, if any remains are uh, uh, recovered, that those can be re- reinterred at the Nashville City Cemetery. Uh, that's the that's the uh, Nashville's oldest public cemetery, and it's really where all his contemporaries are already buried. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that the Tennessee bar association and really the Nashville bar association, I really need to give them credit with, um, Mr. Hal Harden is an attorney here and he's done some great legal work on this, on this behalf and judge George Payne, a retired federal judge is also working really great on it. So we've got a whole team of different people who are, who are, um, interested in, in what we think is doing right by, by, um, by this this person and 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 his wife and any others that might be recovered in in this effort. Now I know that uh, you guys have made a formal application um, to have the body interred or whatever all the right words are. But I know I found it online and it's fascinating. It has a little bit of the history you've talked about and then some other things, including photographs. So if anybody's interested in this story, they could uh, find it and look that up. We'll put it a link to it in the show notes. Um, what what are the next steps? What what happens next? Yeah, so um, what what's going on now is uh, we're in the chancery court uh, uh, phase. And um, so... We, we've gotten permission from the property owner, uh, which, as I said, is owns the, um, the those those gas stations and oil stations um, uh, to to do this. And what it essentially means is you have to um, uh, you have to terminate that piece of property uh, as a cemetery. It is a cemetery right now. Um, those remains are categorized that as a cemetery. And so the chancery of Davidson County has to um, basically terminate the use of that property as a cemetery. Once that happens, then archaeology comes in and they scrape the dirt off about 12 inches of topsoil. And in in so doing, it uncovers the pattern of a grave. Believe it or not, I couldn't believe that. But uh, you can see the pattern of a grave. That's when the archaeologists take their trowels and their brushes and really meticulously go um, go down to to um, f- see if there's any remains left at this point. But if- it has been a long time, um, and and I guess the archaeologists know, you know, typically what one finds when they exhume, you know. Uh, and I think I read the report said the chances are good that he was in a larger than usual coffin, you know. So so that'll help, you know, that'll help uh, possibly f- locate. You know the graves. Yeah, you would think that the people that own the property are eager for it to not be, you know, to get the the bodies, you know, out of there behind their dumpster. Yes. They, they really are. That's a great point. You know, in order for them to sell the property, or if anything happens on the property, now there's a a lot of paperwork, of course, to 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 to, to handle. So yes, they are more than happy to remove that what's called an encumbrance upon the property. And uh, so the property owner is, is, is fully behind it. We've actually uh, had several Haywood um, family descendants that are in favor and, and are, um, are, are involved as well. Uh, did you track that? Did you track them down? Yeah, there's actually, there's actually some here in Nashville uh, and there's some still in the legal profession, believe it or not. Uh, did they know when you contacted them? Do they know they were descendants of Haywood? Yeah, some of our actual have still have the surname of Haywood, and uh, our legal our legal folks um, are still running those circles. And uh, one of which knew his ancestor 
was was not properly marked uh even with the obelisk his grave was uh, basically unknown and uh, and behind that dumpster i think that person has since passed on but yeah the uh, the descendants are are uh are have been notified and are, are supportive of the effort so um we're just trying to do right by their family member and so we're we're waiting now for to find out the end of what's going to happen, we're waiting for everything to be approved, or has it been approved yet? Yeah. So uh, actually, yeah, you're right. We're waiting on the ch- uh, chancellor of Davidson County to approve this petition, and we certainly feel like uh, it is a, a worthy petition, and it will be easily approved. And at that point, uh, we'll have the archaeological firm come in to identify um, if number one, if there are graves there. You know, you, you just don't know until you know. And so, uh, uh, you know, who's to say that the, the Historical Society in 1911 got it right? You know, um, there's evidence certainly so that, that it's there. But until we um, break ground, uh, kind of won't know for sure. So it's right now it's on the desk of the dude in Davidson County. Um, so if you're listening ma'am or sir, please go ahead and sign that so we can get, so we can finally draw this to a close. Uh, (laughs) I want to know what's going to happen as I'm sure people listening to this um, are going to be curious as well. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's a a really big deal. Yeah. You'll have to have us back on uh, for part two of the, of the Haywood uh, saga and uh, see, see what happens. Absolutely. So (laughs) Um, let's assume they find remains, they uh, move them. Will there be a little bit of an exhibit about Haywood at the Tennessee State Museum at some point? Oh gosh, I don't, I don't know. You know, we're 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 commemorating 225 years, so uh, you know, there's all kinds of um, as you as you know, Scott. There's all kinds of different options for uh, <laughs> temporary exhibits at the museum. Yeah, so we've got a backlog of all kinds of fun stuff we want to do. But uh, th- yeah, you, I'll, I'll probably write some blog posts and some things of that nature that uh, that we can we can play around. There's lots of ways to uh, to promote our history uh, and uh, probably do some of that stuff for sure. Yeah, that's not the first time you've answered that question, is it? <laughs> no, no, no. I get we, you know, you you get solicited for lots of different uh, exhibit ideas in in the field. So uh, thankfully, I don't have to make those decisions. Uh, those are left up to our exhibits team and our director. So uh, yeah, yeah. I need to start pushing for the 240th birthday exhibit of Davy Crockett now. So there's five years to get that on the docket. Yes, yes, you do, you, you do. And uh, I should also mention, you know, you're 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 a Davy Crockett expert. You know, they say that John Haywood was uh, second only or third only to Jackson and Davy Crockett for his um, for his ability to spin an anecdote and a yarn. So. Uh, so, so th- there, those two were kind of uh, like-minded talents. <laughs> now, when I was when I was reading some of the documents, um, I couldn't help but feel like there was a book in there, um, and that you would be the perfect person to write that book. So, um, I, there's a lot uh, there's a lot in there that would be fascinating for people to read. Well, your your writing is an inspiration, uh, and uh, your books are are, are are an inspiration too to me and to all, all the uh, historians in the field. So it just, it just takes the discipline to sit down and, 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 and write it. Right. Yeah. I mean, and I'm telling you, people would want to read this or it would also be a great documentary. You didn't get any footage back then, you know, but, but going through the process, what, whatever you could get now, it would be a really interesting, even if it was a YouTube documentary, I think you need to make that one happen. Oh, well, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I can ask, uh, uh, you to help mentor me through that process. So, uh, uh, now Luke, Luke, um, Luke, our producer is an incredible documentarian. So, uh, Luke will, uh, he'll, he'll help you out there and he'll volunteer cause he loves Tennessee. He won't even charge you anything. Oh man. Um, All right, Luke, come on to Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I'll, I'll even um, take you to dinner, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Hey, and and I'll come along. I'll be your grip. So we'll go honky tonking. Um, yeah, I can carry the cords and everything and help you plug in. 
Um, well, this has been um, absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I uh, cannot wait to find out. Um, and again, anybody who's been interested in what we're talking about, we'll put in the show notes the link to that application. It has photographs, and you know, it's really interesting. Um, and and I just I th- thank you for all the work you're doing uh, to preserve Tennessee history, and all the work you're doing uh, for education. And I have about thirty other questions I wanted to ask you about, but I'm going to wait and have you back again just to t- talk about some more Tennessee history. Well, I tell you what, anytime, Scott, you guys are, I, I love you guys out there. And Polly, you all do such fantastic work. I, I want your listeners to know what how what the rest of the museum field in Tennessee thinks of you guys out at Discovery Park. You guys are second to none in how you do things. And uh, you, just like all Tennesseans have a treasure here in Nashville at the Tennessee State Museum, you West Tennesseans have a treasure out there in that in Discovery Park. And uh, we love coming out there. Can't wait to come out there again, man. You guys do it um, as well as anyone out there. And, uh, and uh, yeah, just, just happy to be here. And, uh, and I'll take those next 30 questions next time. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. And thank you. And thank you to all our listeners who've joined Jeff, Emily, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here, as you know, is to inspire children and adults to see beyond, to plan an experience here for you and your family. Visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Discovery Park of America.